Good morning, everyone. I'm so glad that you could join us today um, for the presentation, Jumping Worms, A New Invader in Illinois by Chris Evans. We would like to begin today by recognizing and acknowledging that we are on the lands of the Peoria, Kaskaskia, Piankashaw, Weah, Miami, Muskutin, Odawa, Sauk, Meskwaki, Kickapoo, and Tawatomi, and Chickasaw Nations. These lands were traditional territory of native nations prior to their forced removal. These lands continue to carry the stories of these nations and their struggles for survival and identity. As a grant institution, University of Illinois has a particular responsibility to acknowledge the peoples there, as well as the histories of discussion that have allowed for the growth of institution for the past 100 years. Are also obligated to reflect on it looks like we lost Elizabeth. <laughs> so I think we should just go ahead and um, get started with Chris Evans. Okay, thank you, Amanda. I can go ahead and um, share my screen then. All righty. Hopefully everybody is seeing what I'm seeing here, my, my presentation. Uh, when Elizabeth and Amanda asked me to um, come and talk about jumping worms, it's a topic that I, I do like talking about. It is a new invader. So I, I readily agreed, and I, I think it's worthwhile for having more people know about um, the species. It's something that we're really just learning about, about in Illinois. So I'm going to have more questions and answers probably for you all in the sense that we've really only known about them now for we're going on six years in the state. Uh, there's a lot of active research, so I'll, I'll tell what I know and I'll um, hopefully give you some idea of the direction we're going in terms of what we're going to do with jumping worms moving forward. Thank you, Chris, for picking up when I lost connection. And I just want to remind everybody that uh, they should stay muted, and if they have a question, please put it in chat, and we will ask you those questions at the end of your presentation. And so um, now it's Chris uh, Evans, um, who is an extension forestry and research specialist with the University of Illinois, and he specializes in invasive species and in forest health issues. Chris also serves as the interim state coordinator of the Master Naturalist Program and is president of the Southern Chapter of the Illinois Native Plant Society. So without any further ado, I'll ask Chris to give us his presentation. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Elizabeth. Thanks so much. Uh, I'm going to start just with a little bit of background just to make sure that we're all uh, on the same page in terms of invasive species. I, I see a lot of familiar faces in the, the participant list, so I, I would imagine most of you know this, but it's always good to cover it. Um, and when I talk about an invasive, I'm talking about a species that is not native to that particular ecosystem. It has since been introduced, uh, escaped, and naturalized, and those naturalized populations um, have the ability or are doing some kind of disruption that leads to a negative impact. And that could be ecological functioning, natural communities. Some, there's something that's impacted in a negative way as a result of those uh, exotic non-native species being now on the landscape. And once that happens, that negative impact, what we call damage, uh, we label those an invasive species. And we all know uh, there's a lot of invasive plant species we talk about, but really uh, in Illinois, we have all taxa of invasive species. 
from diseases, invertebrates, mammals, fish, uh, plants. There's, there's a lot of uh, different types of invasives here in Illinois. And I, uh, if you can tell just by listening to me, I grew up in the South. And so this species right here was my introduction to what an invasive species was. Uh, kudzu is something that kind of everybody that grew up in, in the south, southeastern United States kind of knew what kudzu was and knew it was a problem and it caused damage and, and changed the landscape. And so I, I start with that just to show you that like that's kind of the uh, a poster child in terms of what people that don't know about invasives can understand invasives. I would argue nowadays um, in Illinois, silver carp are, are that poster child, right? Uh, everybody's watched the YouTube videos of um, people getting hit in the head by a flying carp. And so even if you're not kind of in the know about invasive species, I think uh, the public kind of understands that this is a problem, right? Jumping worms are kind of getting that way a little bit in the terms that they're really uh, uh, being newsworthy a lot lately, right? So just in the last couple of weeks, I've, we've had a lot of reports and a lot of news stories out there about jumping worms um, in Illinois. And so you can go online just about anywhere um, and you see these uh, these news articles and and you know it's an unusual thing a jumping worm so it definitely catches people's eyes um, but there's a lot of stuff out there even from extension we've had several publications in the recent uh, weeks about them and so uh, it's not surprising that um, we're they're getting a lot of notoriety right it's the right time of year um, people are, are interested in this kind of new thing so it's it, the timing is right to talk to you all about this and this was an article from um, two years ago now, uh, and I was interviewed for this article. And it's one of those things when you got to be careful what you say when you're interviewing. And I said, oh, they're basically everywhere. And so that ended up becoming that little like one off statement I made to the reporter ended up becoming the, the headline for this article. So that was fun. But what I'm going to do today, just since in, uh, jumping worms are a hot topic, I think it's again, it's a great thing to talk to you all about. I'm hoping to just provide an update about jumping worms in Illinois. Where are we seeing them? Kind of what, is, what are the status of these um, now? Discuss some recent research uh, on the impacts of jumping worms. What do we know actually that they are capable of doing and what don't we know? And then really get into how to identify them and, and equip you all with the knowledge to recognize these as jumping worms and not just some other worm. So that way we continue to fill out our map so we understand where they're at better in the state. So going all the way back and just starting with um, why jumping worms are a problem and a little bit about worms in general, earthworms in general in Illinois, you have to go all the way back to the glacial history. And so as the glaciers made their way through Illinois, uh, they basically pushed out our any native earthworms that might have been here. Uh, earthworms were not able to live under the glaciers, and so they were very slow to recolonize following uh, the retreat of the glaciers. So due to this repeated uh, glaciations of Illinois over the last couple hundred thousand years, we were largely devoid of native earthworms. And so if you, you look at the literature out there, and it states that basically few native earthworms exist in northernmost reaches of the continental United States. Um, it was largely due to this glaciation. And in fact, in Illinois, uh, we have only 38 species of earthworms that are known from Illinois, according to this, this article. Um, and out of those, um, most of those are actually introduced species. So it's a very non-diverse group. We don't have a lot of earthworms. Four of our 38 species have only been found in greenhouses. Uh, 20 of those species are considered introduced. So this is a small uh, non-diverse group. So we don't have a lot of native earthworms. And that's important when we talk about kind of impacts of earthworms moving forward. And just a little bit about earthworm ecology. Um, 
as this little graphic states, they are a eating machine, right? So earthworms eat dirt, uh, the decaying organic matter, they feed in these soil layers. And so they're processing through this. And that's why we do like earthworms at times. We like them as decomposers and, and to be able to break down and make organic matter available. But that has its limits in terms of what is natural and what is good for an ecosystem. There are kind of three basic functional groups, if you will, of earthworms, depending on where they reside um, and, and where they feed. There's earthworms that feed primarily in the leaf litter, those that feed primarily and dwell in the topsoil, and those that can really spend most of their time in the subsoil. So in terms of jumping worms, we're looking at that leaf litter and that topsoil. Those really are where um, jumping worms spend the majority of their time and less so in this uh, subsoil layer or deeper down. Although we are finding they do go into that layer, uh, particularly to escape droughty conditions or winter conditions. So this litter, uh, leaf litter and topsoil is really where they tend to spend the majority of their time. So jumping worms are non-native earthworms and they're starting to be associated with these big ecosystem impacts, prim primarily to changes to the soil properties. Um, they're found in several areas across the United States and we're getting increased reports in Illinois. Now, previously, when we first started this in 2015, we were under this understanding that jumping worms were primarily one species, Amythus agrestis. The more that they're being looked at across their entire range and, and in the Midwest particularly, we're realizing that jumping worms um, are actually a complex of closely related species, primarily three species that look alike, they're hard to distinguish, um, two are in that Amythus group, Amythus agrestis is uh, one that we thought they all were, and then one in a very closely related Metafire genus. And so this, this complex is often found together in multiple species. So it's a little not well understood necessarily, but just understand that when I say jumping worms, I'm really talking about this group of three different species that are, that are lumped together now. Um, you may have heard them referred to by a lot of other names, uh, snake worms, Alabama jumpers, crazy worms. There's a bunch of different names these go by. We've settled on jumping worms as the best um, common name for them, but just know that uh, you may hear them in literature or advertised in a bunch of different ways. And there's a lot of states out there that have confirmed jumping worm populations now. Um, they seem to be very widespread in the eastern United States and that is readily apparent when you start doing Google searches and looking at um, programs and projects that deal with exotic earthworms including jumping worms and so you can find uh, easily find websites out there on jumping worms whether you're in Minnesota, uh, Wisconsin here in the Midwest they kind of were the ones that started it. There's Big work in the Smoky Mountains looking at jumping worms. Uh, there's even an entire citizen scientist project based in the Great Lakes called the Great Lakes Worm Watch that looks at all exotic earthworms, uh, the European ones and jumping worms. Uh, New England has problems with them uh, of exotic earthworms in general and include jumping worms. And so a lot of states are dealing with these now. And so we're kind of all collectively building our knowledge up on what these are and their, their impacts. We recently redid our um, fact sheet and invasive species publications here in Illinois on jumping worms. So these are available and they're kind of specific to what we know about in Illinois. But let's kind of dig in now more into exactly what jumping worms are and how you can identify them. So I think that's very important. I think what people are looking for, and I'll have a lot of pictures um, moving forward, but I'm just going to summarize now um, the major ways to tell these worms from other worms. And once you um, kind of understand these basic characteristics, it's not hard to pick these out from other worms. Um, one, they can get large. 
uh, up to eight inches. It says here, I've actually seen them stretched out up to 12 inches or more. So they can be a very large worm. Um, they tend to be darker dorsally than ventrally. So a little bit darker on the top. Overall, they're uh, a glossy worm. So they're shiny, they're rigid and stiff. Um, and that is definitely, definitely compared to like night crawlers, which are one of the other big worms is very different. So this is a stout, stiff worm. They tend to be very active. Um, when you pick them up, they thrash wildly. Um, you touch them, they'll start flipping so hard and thrashing so hard they can actually break their tail off. Um, if they're just moving, they often move like a snake. So I've seen a lot of people mistake this for a earth snakes or worm snakes because they have that side to side movement just like a snake. And they tend to, I tend to see them at times kind of moving right on the surface of the soil, right below the grass and kind of moving like a snake like that. I have a little quick video. Uh, let's see if it plays, hopefully. Hopefully you're seeing this, the jumping worms thrashing about. So the movement is important when you get closer and you want to look at the worms. The, the big characteristic when you're trying to distinguish is this a jumping worm or not, if you have one that meets the, the characteristic so far, is the clitellum. And so the clitellum is the band that goes around the front end of a worm. And so uh, it can be kind of milky white in coloration on, on jumping worms, but that's not always the case. Um, so sometimes it's brown or even dark colored, but importantly, it's smooth and not raised. And so what that means is that the, the band, the clitellum, is basically the same diameter as the rest of the worm. It isn't raised and larger. In a lot of uh, in night crawlers and other worms, that band will be swollen and larger than the rest of the worm. Here it, in jumping worms, they're essentially the same diameter as the rest of the worm. It's kind of a continuous. The other thing that's important about this clitellum, the band, is that it fully encircles the body. If you flip the worm over, that band is going to go all the way around. It's not interrupted. It's not stopped at all, all the way around the body. In night crawlers or some other worms, this band is more like a saddle, where if you look at the underside of it, it's broken there. That's not, doesn't go all the way around. There's a, there's a seam there. In jumping worms, there is no seam. It's just completely um, all the way around. And then lastly, this clitellum starts around the 14th segment of the worm, starting from the, the front of the worm counting backwards. Um, night crawlers, which are the most commonly, uh, most common earthworm that would be misidentified with jumping worms, that band's going to start back in the 20th or farther back segment. So it's much farther back on the body of the worm. On jumping worms, that band is much closer to the front of, uh, of the worm. You can see here with this picture, one, a worm coming out of the ground very clearly. You can see that band is the same diameter as the worm and it's really close to the front of it. Just some more pictures. Um, you can see here again that that band is the same diameter as the worm, the stiff shiny worm, kind of a dark grayish brown color. And then just another one here, uh, a really large worm that we found in southern Illinois. Again, you can see it's very stout, rigid worm with that, that band. And then again, just looking at the front of the worm, you can see the band there is actually almost a little narrower in diameter than the rest of the worm. But when I'm talking about starting at the segment, the 14th segment, if you take the worm and count all these little segments um, that can stretch or, or shrink as it compresses itself, and you can see on this one, the band starts right at the 14th segment. And so that's the easy way, that's one of the easiest ways and one of the most um, definitive ways to kind of pick this out 
is looking at the location of that band on the worm. Where does it start and count those segments? That really helps you separate this from uh, many of the other worms. The other thing that kind of is helpful for picking out in terms of do you have a, a population of earth of jumping worms maybe is the soil signature so heavy um, populations of jumping worms they feed really heavy again i said they're like i said earlier they're concentrated in that upper um, layer of the soil or in the leaf litter they tend to um, through this feeding and worm castings they tend to change the soil signature where it makes these big aggregate sizes and um, almost makes it look like coffee grounds is that one of the terms they use for it and that signature that real big aggregate size and, and that kind of coffee ground look really does um, kind of jump out to you once you see it and that's a good characteristic to indicate that you may have jumping worm populations in that area um, and so it doesn't the thing that we've noticed is it does it doesn't always form like this this tends to form mostly in areas that have um, really rich soils with high organic matter. In heavy clay soils, we don't often see this soil signature forming even when they have jumping worms. So you may not always get this, but um, especially in richer, more fertile soils, this does seem to happen quite a bit. And again, it's, you know, it's noticeable, right? You can see this kind of coffee ground look to it. So just some comparisons. So this is a, a Lumbricus. So this is the, the European night crawler, very, very super common worm found throughout the state. As you can see here, here's the clitellum and it's obviously bigger in diameter than the rest of the worm. And then you can see uh, there's all these segments. And so if you counted these segments, it would be starting beyond the 20th segment uh, of the worm. So much farther back. Just another look, uh, you have a night crawler on the left and a jumping worm on the right. You can see with this night crawler, it's clitellum here isn't that raised. It's not very, very raised, but you can definitely see that it starts way back on the worm. So if you counted this, it would be the 23rd or 24th segment. Whereas on the jumping worm, it's the, about the 14th segment. So in terms of the biology and ecology of jumping worms, they again primarily feed and spend their time in the upper layer of soil and leaf litter, usually in those top four to six inches. They feed on leaf litter, detritus, organic matter in the soil. Um, they are parthenogenic, which means they are able to reproduce without mating. Um, in the farther northern reaches of the populations here uh, in the Midwest, the adults tend to die. And so the populations continue year to year through their cocoons, which they shed, which are little microscopic cocoons, which hold a bunch of eggs. Um, that's how they overwinter. What we're seeing in Illinois is that's not always the case in terms of they don't always die in the cold conditions. In the Southern portions of the state, uh, they tend to actually live all year long so we can find adults even in the early spring or late winter. Um, even in central Illinois or parts of northern Illinois, we've had reports of adult worms even early in the spring, probably overwintering in sheltered places or in mulch piles or compost piles. So if you find an adult worm early in the year, it doesn't mean that it's not jumping worm because we're finding that they tend to, they are able to survive the adults uh, when previously we thought they weren't. So they reach maturity quickly after hatching about half the time as European earthworms. And so they have the potential for two hatches or more per season. Uh, this creates population densities that are reported at 10 times other worm species. So in the right habitat, they can just very much live in high populations. Uh, the adults are most visible starting mid to late summer. As long as you have enough soil moisture, that's when their populations are at their highest and you really start seeing a lot of worms. In terms of kind of the climate and habitat preferences, um, research has found that they started um, hatching, their eggs started hatching when the air temperatures started getting above 50 degrees Fahrenheit. 
And then those die-offs, those winter die-offs started happening as temperatures started falling below 41 degrees. I've seen that they tend to move deeper into the soil as it gets cold and so they can survive. Uh, maturation time is anywhere from 77 to 93 days or so. It takes to go from a hatchling to a matured able to reproduce. And there have been, show, there's been studies that have shown that the cocoons can survive in soil temperatures uh, in excess of negative 20 degrees Fahrenheit. So the cold's not going to kill the, the cocoons anyway. Again, what I've seen is they tend to avoid or move when the soil conditions are dry. So you may have an area where if there's plenty of soil moisture, you'll find tons and tons of, of jumping worms. But as the soil dries out, those worms will either move to a, a more moist conditions or usually go deeper into the soil to try to find moisture. And so you'll have in droughty conditions, the worms will appear to be completely absent, but they'll resurface when the, the moisture comes back. And again, they love that moist soil. In terms of impacts, uh, what's happening with these worms? Um, there's been several studies, although we definitely need more. And one study found an 84 to 95 percent decline in for in the foliage litter mass in so in forested soils. So that basically means the litter mass is your leaves. Um, the dying parts of plants and things like that, that amass on top of the soil, that fairly quickly within a growing season. And this was a, a mesocosm study where they just had these big pots that they, they put worms in and looked at, that it declined. So they basically completely lost that litter mass. They, they ate through the, the, the detritus, they ate through the, um, the organic matter and completely just processed it very quickly. Um, there was one other study that found a 24% decrease in the forest floor mass in just 80 days. And that's through accelerating the decomposition of this organic matter of the um, detritus that's on the floor. And all this resulted in a changes to the nutrient availability. And so it's, it's actually really interesting in kind of how this happens. And so by processing this organic matter that had been trapped up, the carbon and everything that's trapped up in um, decaying leaves and other organic matter, they actually move through that so fast that they let uh, a lot of, they changed a lot of that nutrients to be available. So you had this pulse of high nutrient availability very quickly following kind of the worms in there and feeding on this organic matter. So you had all this nutrient availability, but that the, they were in a more mobile form. And so what happened was you lost nutrients very quickly after that due to it leaching or moving off site. And so instead of um, the organic matter, the leaf litter decomposing slowly over time and kind of serving as that bank of nutrients for the forest floor that provided kind of a steady supply of nutrients to the plants over time, uh, you had this pulse of high nutrient availability and you basically depleted all the bank account for nutrients followed by a crash and a loss of nutrient availability after that. They just ate through the bank. Um, and that led to an overall decrease in soil carbon, overall decrease in loss of nutrients over time. Even though you had a short pulse of high nutrient availability. And then that feeding again, those worm castings and that change in soil structure, it led to an increase in soil aggregate size. So you had those larger soil particles that were aggregated together. And that had some big changes as well. That larger soil aggregate size didn't hold water as well. So water moved through, percolated through, that had another chance to pull more nutrients out as the water moved through. The soil became more droughty. It lost its structure, so it held roots a little less. The roots dried out a little more. So it was a big change in how plants can utilize and even macroinvertebrates can utilize the soil when it was um, not able to hold as much water and not able to hold as much nutrients. And again, just looking at those soil conditions, um, that big aggregate size like that, you can kind of see those coffee grounds. That's just not going to hold as much um, soil moisture, not going to be as good for roots. And so you had conditions like this. And this was actually uh, a landowner sent me these pictures from northern Illinois of his lawn. And it just was devastated from 
uh, jumping worms. Some here's some pictures of just large swaths of dead, um, dead lawn that just the plants, the, the grass could not grow in there. Um, and he said this really thinned out over a year or two, um, largely due to those jumping worms moving in. It was really a drastic change. We have had some recent research from the University of Illinois looking at kind of climate change, soil chemistry, what's happening with these. They're finding that jumping worms increase the metabolic rate of organisms in the soil, and that increases the uh, release of carbon dioxide. Um, it increases the release of carbon and nitrogen, both um, from soil storage. And again, you get those higher rates of fertility immediately, but then it depletes those long-term stores. So over time, you lose fertility in your soil. And that changes the bacterial and the fungal communities of the soil by changing the soil chemistry and even changing the soil pH um, due to these uh, the worm feedings. And there's been some really interesting research coming out of, uh, this is mostly out of uh, the Smoky Mountains area and, and I think some in Vermont, but there was some big changes to soil wildlife due to jumping worm feedings. And so one of these looked at kind of how did salamanders deal with having jumping worms? And these are terrestrial salamanders that, as I'm sure you know about, salamanders love to live in moist conditions, hide underneath of organic matter. Um, and they found that simply since the worms were eating through all this organic matter, uh, all the leaf litter that the, the salamanders normally hide in, that it basically made these salamanders have to move more often. Instead of sitting in one site and feeding and staying there, they had to move three or three and a half times more often because um, the objects they were hiding under, the cover that they, they, they lived in, uh, was getting eaten out from above them. And so they had to move, they had to um, change and find new cover, and that uh, they thought had big implications to their ability to mate, to brood, to rear young, um, simply because they didn't have a, a consistent place to hide, consistent cover. They had to spend a lot of their time moving and finding new places to live. And in fact, a little quote from that study, it said, by the third week of the experiment, the earthworms had visibly broken down a large portion of the leaf litter in the microcosms. And on the final day of the study, only woody debris and then a surface layer of worm castings were left to serve as habitat for the salamanders. So a drastic change to the salamanders habitat quality. Another study found uh, millipedes, which are a common soil macroinvertebrate, decreased in abundance and richness in areas where jumping worms are there. And so from this, we know there's big changes to the soil chemistry, big changes to the soil structure. And it seems like there's um, some major changes and major implications to soil wildlife due to these changes. Uh, in terms of plants, there's less research out there looking at um, how these impacts uh, from jumping worms are, are happening to our native plants. There are a lot of research looking at um, European earthworms. They're finding some big changes to those. Um, and, and with those European earthworms, they're finding things like a reduction in herba herbaceous plant cover. Um, they're finding often earth European earthworm invasions are associated with uh, non-native invasive plant invasions as well. They kind of go hand to hand. We expect those same things are happening with jumping worms. It's just it hasn't been looked at um, through research as much. Um, I have found several observations from landowners in Illinois since we get a lot of reports in terms of a residential or a landscape uh, setting. And they found and reported things like large pas patches of grass suddenly started dying, ornamental plants are struggling, swaths of bare ground are visible, and somebody even reported that shrubs have actually started tipping over. And I think that's because the, the soil was less capable of holding in their roots. There is um, one study that was recently done from the University of Illinois that looked at um, basically how does earthworms impact seedlings of either exotic seedlings or native seedlings. And overall, the kind of gist of this, they found that um, sugar maple, that sugar maples tended to do better actually when there was more um, jumping worms, the seedlings of sugar maple did and white oaks tended to do worse. 
So that's just one small piece of a study there, but I thought it was pretty interesting. And European buckthorn, which is a big problem in the, the northern parts of the state as an invasive plant, tended to do better in invaded areas as well. So just digging a little more into this, um, this is a, a, a a, a graphic here and it, it's for European earthworms but again we assume the same things happening with jumping worms where you get that subsidence of soil as the leaf litter and the organic matter is being processed through so quickly um, you get exposed roots you get less plants growing and you get loss of, of nutrients out of there and so here are some pictures of European earthworm invasions in a forest again we expect uh, jumping worms to kind of have similar effects where you have these large patches of, of uh, bare soil kind of as a result. And I like this one, they call it the, the worm, the warm worm front, not a warm front like weather, but a worm front moving through a hardwood stand. And that brings up a point that worms in general themselves do not move very quickly. Um, something like the matter of a meter or two a year, a population is going to increase. So these things aren't moving and spreading on their own. Once they're out of sight, it's going to be a slow spread from where they were introduced. Um, but they move around a lot by people. I think that is really where you're looking at um, how these things spread throughout the landscape. It's us moving them. And in particular, we're moving them through moving mulch, compost, moving soil, plants, especially if the plants have uh, roots that have dirt still on them. Some are being moved in the bait or vermiculture industries as well. And those are more long distance spread and you can still find them for sale, right? You can go online and do a search here. You're able to buy 5,000 Alabama jumpers if you so decide, right? And so these are jumping worms. Um, so they're still available. People like them for vermiculture because they do process through or put them in compost piles because they process through that organic matter so quickly. So unfortunately, you can still find them. They are getting spread around. In terms of management, right now, we do not have any approved effective control methods. There is some promising work out there looking at um, lawn fertilizers as a control method, particularly those that have the saponids in there and natural substance. Um, but there's nothing labeled for it right now. There has been some research that's shown in a forest setting. Uh, the use of prescribed fire may help reduce the number of viable cocoons and then lower down the survivorship of jumping worms. Um, but what we're really talking about now is focusing on spread prevention. So if you have jumping worms, take steps not to move them to other people. Or if you don't have jumping worms, pay attention to what you're bringing onto your land so you don't move them onto your land accidentally. And so there's uh, best management practices out there. Things like clean soil and debris from vehicles, equipment, gardening tools, uh, before moving in and out of areas that may have jumping worms. The same thing you would do to prevent something like spreading garlic mustard. Um, watch for jumping worms, watch for signs of their presence. If you do find them, report them. We definitely want to know where they're at in the state. Educate yourself about jumping worms so you can recognize them. And then also look at um, selling, planting, purchasing plants or garden material that are uh, appear free of jumping worms. And that's kind of a tricky one. Um, you're not gonna be able to see those cocoons. They're tiny, they're microscopic. So um, sharing plants, digging up plants from your yard and splitting them and moving them to another yard uh, or selling them to somebody or giving them that tends to be a way that you may spread these around. Sharing mulch, community compost piles, that's another way that we seem to move jumping worms right around. So kind of restricting your use of compost to those that were well managed and put in, you know, appropriately managed uh, compost piles that that did was able to reach those internal temperatures um, to kind of kill off the worms. Those seem to be safe when you're using that kind of compost, but just the neglected community compost pile that anybody can add and take from, those seem to be kind of high risk in terms of um, jumping worms. Now, in terms of these worms in the Midwest, the first population really in the Med Midwest was identified in Wisconsin in 2013 in southern Wisconsin. And they found it kind of spread throughout now uh, a lot of Wisconsin. That got us 
interested in since it was so close to Illinois and looking forward in Illinois. And we started doing some um, outreach out there, asking people about them in Illinois. Um, if we looked at historically and where are the historic records, we had several jumping, uh, sp several species of worm in that same Amythus genus uh, reported historically in Illinois, but these are not the ones that were considered jumping worms. Two of these were only really found in greenhouses in the state. And then one of those found a report that said they were well established in the Champaign Urbana area. Um, but again, this is not the same worm that not one of those three worms we consider jumping worms, but that's kind of what we previously knew from this genus. We decided to really uh, set up and look for these worms because we were worried about them um, becoming established in Illinois since they were so close in, in Wisconsin. So we pulled together uh, a list of entities and groups that were worried about jumping worms and, and were already talking and communicating a lot on invasive species. So we added this kind of to the list of things that we wanted to deal with and, and address. And we started getting reports of jumping worms. So in 2015, we, we uh, received seven reports of jumping worms in northeastern Illinois. Um, and so we knew we had them there. We got more words out. We put our first publications out and really started asking people to look for them in 2015. And so by 2018, we had um, discovered additional populations in northeastern Illinois and then a large spread out uh, populations of them in southern Illinois. And then some sus suspect populations that we were not able yet to confirm. And then by 2021 now, as you can see, um, we're starting to really fill out this map and get, get them and discover that they're much more widespread than we previously thought. Um, I don't doubt they're much more widespread than even this map shows, but this is where we've had verifiable reports from. And to date, we have about 75 reports in 26 different confirmed counties. And we have five other suspected counties. And a suspect county is one where we had pictures, but they were not clear enough to be able to identify them uh, conclusively as jumping worms. Or we had very, very good descriptions um, that really pointed towards jumping worms. But again, we didn't have the data, or the, the proof to, to prove it. So we left those as suspect. Um, so we went from, and now a little under six years, we went from seven reports in three counties to 75 reports in now 31 counties, if you count the suspect counties. Uh, but it's important to note that 75 reports, we had so many reports from the, the counties in Northeastern Illinois that we stopped tracking those counties. So we still get reports from those people tell us about them a lot, but we're not tracking those actively just because we consider many of those areas generally infested because we have so many reports from those Northeastern counties. In terms of new county report confirmation, right now what we're looking for, because this is not a um, regulated plant, there's not regulations for this in the state, we are able to confirm new counties based upon good quality imagery or, or video, good footage. So we're asking people if they have new counties to report um, particularly or um, additional reports in some of those counties that are any county that's not in Northeastern Illinois, you can send those quality images or, or video clips, send them to me and there's my email address um, for verification and I'm tracking them, I'm keeping the database for these reports so we can expand, um, kind of expand the map and really get a good sense of where they're at in the state. So here are just some pictures, um, different pictures that have been reported to me or, or actually live worms that were sent to me and then I was able to take the pictures We've had things like this one from Cook County. Here's Sangamon and Will County reports. Lake County reports, you can see the soil structure there and a couple worms. This also was accompanied with some closer pictures so we could identify it and a little video to show you. This is the champion, I think, from Pope County at 12 inches nearly. Um, really a huge worm. So kind of in summary, uh, 
these jumping worms are a complex of several species that are in two closely related genera. They are widely established in the, United, in the Eastern United States. We're finding them throughout Illinois now um, in central, southern, and northern Illinois. And the research so far has shown they have really do have the potential to impact the soil structure, soil fertility, wildlife, and even potentially plant growth. So there seems to be some big impacts to jumping worms um, that we're, we're starting to see. And so because of this, we are concerned about them and we want to have um, a better sense of where they're at in the state. So we're asking people to report new suspect populations. You can find them throughout the growing season, but it's, they seem to be most visible in that June to October time, although we're getting a lot of reports on them even this month here. Um, do I think that these are going to be one of the worst invasive species that we have? No, I don't think so. Um, do I think they're going to be devastating to people's lawns and, and landscaping areas? No, I don't think so. I think there's, you can definitely still have productive gardening and, and landscaping even with jumping worms, but you're going to have to maybe um, change your fertilization or, or addition of mulch practices um, to kind of overcome that, or maybe even change some of your species selection and what you decide to grow or not, depending on how it does. So I don't want to sound the alarm so loud that I, this is, you know, all hands on deck of the biggest problem, but it is definitely something to know about. I think they're a lot more widespread than we even know yet. And so what I wanted to do for the rest, one, I have my email again up there, cwevans at illinois.edu. Um, but I really wanted to leave plenty of time, and it looks like I have, to um, answer any questions you may have, get into a discussion if you want, because usually there's a lot of questions around jumping worms. So I wanted to make sure that we were able to, to answer some of your questions. So I'm going to stop my share, I guess. So um, I can take any questions you might have. Thank you very much, Chris. That was extremely interesting. And so I'm really, really pleased that you gave us that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Good. Um, there are a lot of questions and I'm going to go through some of them and then there may be others that come up. Um, first of all, is there a good site where we can follow updates? Um. Yeah, no, not in Illinois. We don't have a site just for jumping worms. You could go to extension. So what we're doing with our publications is um, we're updating the maps regularly in our publications on there. Um, so we don't have a good website necessarily just to look for that. Wisconsin does have a pretty good, has a pretty good website. Um, you can look at their DNR website. They have really good information on jumping worms. So in terms of looking at uh, you know, new research and things like that, that would be a good one to follow. Or you could follow um, Extension Forestry on social media, um, on our Facebook page, because we do post a lot on there. And if we have any updates, often we post it there as well. Okay. Um, of course, everyone wants to know about killing them and whether it's useful to kill them or whether the cocoons are still going to be there. And if it is useful, what's the best way? Somebody suggested drying out in the sun. You can, I mean, you can kill adult worms, uh, drying them out in the sun. You can do a lot of things like that. That's one way to do that. Um, realistically, you know, you're seeing a fraction of the population and you're able to get to a fraction of the pop population. So while you can kill some adult worms, it may make you feel better. It's probably not gonna have that big of an impact on your overall population. Um, again, there's not a lot of good management recommendations right now that are approved for use. Um, there is some promising research out there, again, looking at some of these organic um, fertilizers, particularly ones with saponids in there, that um, seems to work to control earthworms. So I'm hopeful in the next couple of years, we're going to have some um, control options for you. The one thing that you can do if you're interested and people do that is um, they do a survey with mustard powder 
So you take a little bit of mustard powder, you mix it in water, and I can't remember the ratio right now, but you can find it online. You can pour that then into your soil. It irritates the worms and it causes them to come up out of the soil to try to escape the mustard powder water. And um, you can find them that way. You can collect them that way. Um, we use that as a survey technique to try to find jumping worms actually is this mustard water drench. Um, you, you've talked quite a bit about the leaf litter mm -hmm. and how they like it, but um, does mulch or leaf litter actually stop us from seeing them? It may. I mean, if you add mulch or leaf litter on the top, you're not going to be able to see that soil structure form. Uh, you may see less worms on the top, certainly. Yeah, you may not see them as much, but what it does do is, especially in a residential area or a landscaping area, it, it adds more soil organic matter. It creates more opportunity to replace that fertility that's being lost in your soil. Okay, so actually you're saying we should use more compost, not less, if we've got them. It's, it's a way to try to combat the negative impacts from them. Mm -hmm. yeah. So um, several people want to know about things about compost, like um, what about bagged compost? Is that safe? In general, we say that it's probably a low risk uh, uh, thing to use because it's probably comes from a facility that's a little more intensively managed in terms of developing that compost and um, heating it up, you know, moving it, turning the compost, heats it up to the appropriate temperatures to kill pathogens and cocoons out of it and, and other things. So we consider that, safe is a tough word to use, we consider that a lower risk uh, okay. product than others. So, so Cook County actually offers free mulch um, do you know anything about that or can you tell us what questions we should ask the um, county before we use it? I would say just ask how it's managed and if it's, you know, if it's a mulch pile that's turned, you know, regularly, it's managed that way um, versus it's just a pile that's sitting in the back and you can draw from it. I think that's the way you just want to have a, you want to have a compost that's managed correctly, right? And again, turned, added the right way, watered when it needs to be watered to, to break that down. That's That kind of compost is going to be um, more lower risk than neglected compost. So, so talking about watering the compost, um, if there's flooding, does that actually kill them or just move them? Um, that's a good question. It's not one that I know um, the, necessarily know the answer to in the sense that I haven't seen research on that. I would imagine like any worms, if your soil is completely saturated with water, they're going to come out of the soil to be able to get oxygen and they may move that way. Many of them probably die in flood events um, like we've all seen, right? You get a heavy rain, the worms come to the top. So yes. I don't doubt that these do the same thing. Yes. Yeah, so they cross the road. <laughs> right. Um, how about wood chips or other compost that is it's not very good compost but it, it's mulch um is that less problem yeah so wood chips are probably going to be less lower much much lower risk right so they're not um at that current state they're not necessarily food for jumping worms i don't think jumping worms will be moving through there so they'd be lower risk for housing um cocoons as they break down over time, the worms could certainly feed upon them. But yes, that would be a lower risk item, I would, I would imagine, for spreading jumping okay. worms. And once, once the soil has been ruined, and you showed us several pictures of, of large patches of lawn that no longer exist, mm -hmm. um, do the worms then die or move on? Um, that's a good question, too. I would, and that's, again, I don't know necessarily um, the long-term implications of that. This is something we're still actively researching. Um, as the, the fertility and basically the worm food is lost out of those soils, I would imagine at a minimum level, you're going to reduce the density of jumping worms in there. They're going to move to the periphery of their populations to gain access to uh, fresh organic matter, fresh food. Um, but you'll still have some jumping worms in there, I would imagine, too. But it's, it's going to be like anything else is they're going to migrate to where the food sources are. Yes. Yeah, so along those lines, is there anything known about plants that are toxic to them? 
so we could maybe seed the now no longer lawn and help people realize that they should not have lawns but have native areas? That is a great question, and it's not one that I know the answer to. I know that people are looking at it, particularly um, there's some researchers in Vermont, there's researchers at SUNY in New York that are doing a lot of work on jumping worms right now. So I would imagine answers to those kind of questions will be coming in the next you know, four or five years, but it's not something that I, I can't give any specifics now because I don't know. Yes. So um, should we no longer share plants with one another? <laughs> that's, that's the million dollar question. I get that question a lot. Um, so again, like I said, at, right at the end, I don't think this is the end all in terms of this is not the worst invasive in the world that's going to end everything and it's going to be just wreck everything. So in that sense, um, it's not the worst, but it's still something to take account to. I think you can share plants safely if you take the right precautions. I think just pulling a hosta out of the ground and giving it to somebody else is going to be a high risk environment, a high risk practice. But, but if we wash, if we wash off the roots, is this what you're going to say? Yes. So washing roots, repotting them in, um, you know, in pots with, with, um, you know, other soil that's, you know, you get, you know, potting awesome. soil or something like that. That's going to lower the risk. How do um, I know that the cocoons are not still there? That's the problem. You don't, right? You can't see the cocoons. And so taking steps to try to reduce that risk, like, like you said, washing roots, repotting them after you wash the roots, growing plants from seeds in potting mix, things like that would be the way to reduce the risk from this. And the other thing I'll mention is that there's a lot of areas of the state, particularly in the northeastern part of the state, that is very, very uh, generally infested. There are a lot of places. So in those cases, if you've got worms and they've got worms, it doesn't necessarily matter if you share them back and forth that way, right? So there's some level of reasonability to this where I'm not going to recommend that you stop sharing everything and halt everything when there's situations where it's not going to be a problem. You just have to understand your particular situation and what you can and can't do. So let's take a specific like DuPage County and they've had terrible infestations for the last several years. So uh, first of all, should they still be mulching? Should we put on more compost there? Um, and should we have special nutrient replacement um, in a bottle? Um, so that's good. Those are good questions. And so, um, you know, I don't, I'm not a fan of mulching and, and adding nutrients into natural environments. I think that doesn't make as much sense to me, but if you're looking at a landscape situation, you're looking at ornamental situations and you want to be able to grow what you want to grow. You want to have a thriving lawn and a pretty um, uh, uh, landscaping plants. You, you're going to want to do what you need to do to be able to do that. And so that would be fertilization, whether it's liquid fertilization, it would be addition of organic matter, um, mulching, composting, those practices um, can overcome any negative impacts that you might see from jumping worms. So yeah, I think you should do those to achieve your goals that you want on your land in a, in a landscape setting. In a natural setting, I don't think you necessarily should do that. I think that's probably uh, artificial additions that may or are not necessarily going to have uh, a lot of positive impacts. So in a natural setting, we kind of have to tolerate the worms right now. But in a landscape setting, there's things you can do to allow you to have the landscape that you want to have. Yeah, understood. So now one person um, noted that uh, their spouse actually likes to use jumping worms um, to go fishing and that several of the areas that seem um, the worst infested are close to rivers or lakes. Is it possible that actually fishing is is a sort of a secondary problem and that we should be warning fishermen um it's possible yeah sure i mean if you especially if you dig your own you dig your own worms which we all like to do when you go fishing you could certainly be pulling up jumping worms and moving them around 
And remember, these are parthenogenic worms, which means they don't need a mate to reproduce. So I certainly think it's within the realm of possibility that um, fish bait is, a, is, a, is an avenue of spread. I do know that DNR was um, looking at, um, you know, they permit, you know, uh, the sale of fishing bait, they, of live bait, they permit the, um, the production of it, and they would not permit facilities that want to do jumping worms. So they are looking at it like that. But even just a home digger of worms, I do think you need to be uh, careful what you're doing, right? You don't oh. want to necessarily spread these around. Yes, um, that makes a lot of sense. Um, do the birds eat them? And I think you mentioned maybe others. Are there a possum or anything like that? Small mammals? Yeah, I I would think anything, and I don't have data on this. Again, this is something that we just don't know. Uh, observationally, I've seen that, uh, you know, ducks will eat them, uh, chickens will eat them, stuff like that. I don't doubt that uh, our native wildlife that eat worms naturally are going to key in on these as well. I mean, they're um, they're big, they're abundant. I would imagine our wildlife will, will feast upon them when they can. Um. Could you maybe go back to the picture or else just talk about um, the materials in which jumping worms can be transported in which we should be so careful? And uh, along those lines, is it possible even if we have dirty boots or dirty gloves that we've got cocoons? It's possible with that. It's unlikely if you just have some dirt on your gloves. Um, uh, and just a little bit of dirt on your boots. If you got really muddy boots or something like that, it's certainly possible. But really anything that moves soil is going to be at risk for moving uh, jumping worms. And so that includes mulch and compost because we know that the worms will move up into those. Um, actually moving topsoil plants if there's plants with roots intact uh, with soil on them. Those are the, some of the things where you're going to do it equipment with muddy boots or sorry equipment with muddy tires and those things if you have a light dusting of, of dirt on your on your boots or a light dusting of dirt on your gloves that risk is a lot lower than if you're doing a if you dig up a plant stick it in a pot and move it yeah um and you know thinking of illinois as an agricultural state are we starting to have a problem with the ag industry that is a fantastic question. And what we've seen is that the intensive management of agricultural fields, either through tillage, fertilization, uh, um, chemical applications, does not seem to favor worms. And so we actually are not seeing worms, uh, jumping worms, or most many, many worms in general, in agricultural fields. And so because of that, I do not think this is going to be a problem or a risk for agriculture in Illinois. Even for organic? Um, um, in organic agriculture, it, that may be different, but looking at large scale kind of commercial agriculture right now, I don't think it's an issue. In organic agriculture, you may have some issues with it in that in those situations, yes. That's it's, But it's an unknown. And like I said at the beginning, I want to have more questions than answers to this. And the big question is we don't know. And so a lot of this, as I hope I'm getting across this speculation at this point, we're still discovering and figuring out a lot of this right now. Maybe we can um, buy a collection of robins and have them come into our <laughs> yard. Huh? There you go. Perfect. <laughs> that, that would be a lot of fun. Um, I, I think I've caught most of them and I noticed that we're out of time anyhow. Um, I think that you can tell from the number of questions you got that we're all morbidly fascinated <laughs> by this subject. Um, we didn't have a plant sale here in Macon County this year, um, and it broke our hearts. And I don't know how long we're going to have to go on with that. At the moment, I noticed that there's no marking on your map on Macon County or Pyatt. However, I can't help feeling that's just because we, we haven't noticed them or haven't reported them. I think uh, Macon County had a, had a, had, was positive, I do believe. I think I just got a report today or yesterday on it. Mm -hmm. But yes, you're right. Um, the big thing that I want to know is where are these? And so 
Um, I certainly hope that as you, as you, as you do your activities, you're out there and you see worms that may be jumping worms that you report them to me, because I think one of the things in terms of determining what's the appropriate responses and what we should and shouldn't be doing is understanding where these worms are. And there's different responses if they're already widespread versus if they're not widespread. And I also certainly hope that you all figure out ways and do to continue your plant cells and be productive in that and promote native plants um, that way, um, even in the face of jumping worms, right? I, I think there's ways to do that. So I would encourage you all to continue those uh, cells and figure out ways you can continue those cells um, and be productive, but also safe. Chris, thank you so much. This has been really excellent information that we all felt that we needed. I'm happy to do it. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth.